Welcome to the Mary Mack Show, where we will be talking about your feelings, experiences, and pain following the death of a loved one. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you find yourself in this entire world, I welcome you. So how are you doing, my friend, my warrior? I certainly hope this week has given you a little more sense of peace. So today, I wanted to share something with you, a new site just for the podcast. So the address is www.themarymacshow.com, appropriately, and I hope you'll take a moment to go there and see the new site, and please do subscribe in the upper right-hand corner to the podcast platform that you prefer, and also to rate and review the podcast. I know we have people from 60 different countries around the world, and I'd love to know how this has helped you. We have received wonderful reviews from very loyal listeners, and I want to thank them so much for taking the time to review the podcast. Next, I wanted to remind you that the Mary Max store has some beautiful products for yourself and others who are bereaved to give them as gifts, or for yourself. So thank you for taking some time to look at that, and you can find that at store.marymac.info. So today, I'd like to talk to you about decisions that should wait. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there are things in life that may need attending to after the death of someone very close to you but I don't want you to do them quickly. Some of those choices are moving to a new home, making decisions about their possessions, deciding when to return to work for yourself, or perhaps getting a new job, finding a new location, a completely new city or town that you might want to move to, Major financial moves such as selling your home and how you're going to invest the proceeds of perhaps a life insurance policy that was left for you. Also, what about all the investments you do have and how would you like to handle those moving forward? You'd also need to create a new will for yourself, especially if one of your children have died or if you've lost a spouse. You might need a trust now, and also a DNR order, do not resuscitate for yourself. So these are certain things that we'll address today, but you have to remember that grief takes a great toll on us, not just our emotions, also our physical body our spiritual sense, and also the financial areas of our life. We need to tread lightly and care for ourselves. We need to be gentle with ourselves. 
We need to realize that most decisions we make after such a difficult loss will take time and consideration, and that doesn't mean they should be handled overnight. We wouldn't want it to. There are many changes that happen for us after we've lost someone. Our relationships with the people in our lives can change. We might feel that we are grieving in a different way than they are and at different periods of time. You may be walking on eggshells around your husband ever since your child died because one day you're happy and the next day you're not. And then the reverse happens for him. Your priorities change. Your interests even change. And the goals you have that you once set with your spouse, they no longer exist. And now you have to look at your goals again. They may be completely different now. You might find that you enjoy different friendships than your traditional ones. People that you might have met at a support group tend to bring you more happiness. They understand you better, and so your relationships will change. Also, your routines change. If you were taking care of your spouse and he was dying, there was a long stretch there when you were the caregiver. And now that responsibility and that routine is no longer needed. And there's a sense of asking yourself, who am I right now? I used to be a spouse. I used to be a wife or a husband. I used to be a caregiver. And now, who am I? I really don't know anymore. And the routines that we had before, how we gave them the medication, and when we would bring them outside, and when they would be bathed, all of those things are no longer there for you. They're not a priority, obviously. That's not something you need to attend to any longer. And also, when a spouse dies or a family member, we take on different responsibilities we may not have taken on earlier. For instance, if you were not the person who handled all the finances, then you need to learn that skill. If you weren't the one who drove all around, you might have to learn that skill also. I remember when my aunt became a widow. My uncle, Pete, he would be the one who drove them everywhere, and she had to relearn how to drive, which I helped her with. And I was glad to do it. She needed to be independent. She needed to know that she could go wherever she needed to go by herself, safely, and that was important to me. If you were a wife or a husband, and it was your partner who was the breadwinner, and that was your decision, someone stayed home with the young children, then maybe since their death, you need to reevaluate what needs to be done. Maybe the children need to go in daycare because you need to go back to work for yourself to bring in enough money for the family now. The death of a family member can bring great changes in your financial world. You might have also received Social Security benefits for both of you, at least here in the States, or a pension of some kind from companies or utilities, or even government agencies that you worked for. And those pensions may go away now that the person who brought in that pension money is no longer here. So let's talk more now about the major moves that may need to be considered and how you would handle them. So let's look at the possibility that you might need to move from your home, whether that's to a newer, downgraded version to help with finances, 
or to a completely different home, that decision should not be made right away. That decision needs to be considered for quite a while. It shouldn't be something that you do immediately. There are many ramifications to this move. If you have young children who are still in school, would they be completely uprooted from where you live now? How would they feel about that? Would you wait until they finish their schooling before you moved? Do you need to move because your husband was in the military or your wife was in the military and it is expected that you will be moving off base? Where shall you go? Will you move temporarily with other family members until you figure out what the best plan of action is? Maybe that's the answer. Maybe you need to speak with loyal, trusted friends and colleagues who you know will tell you the truth and will give you various options for you to consider. Another issue that's very difficult is what do I do with their possessions and when do I do it? Well, there are families whose children have died and they keep their room intact for very many years. And I'm not here to tell you that you shouldn't do that, but I am here for you to think about that. In the beginning, it will bring you great comfort to go in their room, hold their possessions, sit on their bed, lie on their bed, as well as the other family members who really need to feel close to them. You all may decide you want a piece of their clothing to wear to bring you more comfort, and you're not ready to give up anything that they owned or how the room looked when they died. There's a part of you that doesn't want to touch anything because it's important to you that you fib yourself and lie to yourself and try to believe that they're still alive. And you might go there when you're still in shock. You might try to convince yourself they're still alive. Many people do this, but there will come a time when you realize that this isn't so. And sometimes at that point, the pain is even greater than in the beginning when you had the bubble around you. The bubble that tried to make you believe they were still there somewhere with you. That they would walk in the door again. That you would see them at the dinner table again. That you could hug them and love them. And they were still a part of your family. But they're not. And at some point that will come to pass. You will realize that that's not the case, sadly. So what do you do with their belongings? Well, for the first year, I would recommend you don't do anything. Don't do anything. And later on, sit with your family and talk about what you think should be done with the belongings. If it's just too much for you to deal with right now, you can always put them in boxes, put them in the attic or the basement, and keep them safe, although unseen. That might be more comforting. You have to decide what will be the best for you and your family. But in the beginning of your grief, it is not the time to do something like this. Stripping away all the pictures out of the frames or stripping them away from the mantle or the bookcase is not going to bring you any comfort. It will make you feel a void that you don't need right now. If you can't deal with that, put them away in a box for the time being and you can decide later on. There may be a need for you to make a major financial move whether that is selling your home or how you invest your funds. 
You need to be around people you trust who can help you learn what needs to be done financially for yourself. You might not have the flexibility of waiting to sell your home, all based on what your financial picture looks like. And if you do, well then, sit with people you trust, make good decisions, find the right real estate broker, the person who will do right by you, get recommendations from others. But if you can wait, please do so. Especially if you have young children. It might be the only home they've ever known, and they want to stay in it for as long as they possibly can. Maybe their entire childhood in their teenage years. It was the place they saw their dad every day. They saw their mom every day. They saw their brother or sister every day. They need that consistency right now until they become more aware of the loss and how it's been affecting them. They need to grieve with you in that place. And the last thing I'd like to discuss is setting up a new will and a trust and a DNR order. A DNR or do not resuscitate order is so that if you were to be in an accident or if you were on life support, what would you like done? Do you want someone to keep you there? Or do you want to impose a do not resuscitate order so that you were not kept alive if you were in vegetative state? Also, creating a new will. Because the will you might have had with your partner or your spouse is no longer valid. You need to prepare one that's just for you now. And if you have children, they have to be incorporated in it. And a trust is necessary, especially if you have children or finances you want to protect. You put these funds into that trust for certain people when they reach a certain age. Your husband may have left a certain amount of money for your children's education, but they are still young. So that money can go into a trust. If, God forbid, something happened to you, those funds are there when the child reaches age to go to college. These different responsibilities are not easy to handle. And a lot of us are not sure of the exact right timing. But I want you to be kind to yourself and I want you to get the help you need and the education you need so that you can make wise decisions when it comes to these issues. Grief is messy, and it takes time. And I want you to have your affairs in order. It's very important. So take out your journal and start to write the different things that need to be addressed. Do you have to move? Do you have finances that need to be taken care of? Do they need to be invested properly? Do you need to learn how to do that? Do you need to find people you trust to talk to about that? Should you make appointments about that? What realtor might you just use to help you with this? Someone who can appraise your home and inspect your home and see what it might be worth on the market right now. What will you do with the children's clothing? What will you do with the baby carriage? What will you do with their other possessions? This is a very painful thing that needs to be addressed. And in good time, you will do so. But write all these things out as you go along so that when you feel comfortable and the time comes, you will address these one by one. I have every confidence that you are capable of doing this. I trust you to do the right thing for yourself first and for the other members of your family. 
You are a warrior. You've lived through this already. You're getting to a good place. I'm sending you my love and hugs. And have faith in yourself that this will all come together in the right timing. So now it's time to get up and dance, dance, dance. And I know you think this is a little wacky, but please just do this for me anyway. Thank you for joining me today and share my podcast with those who might benefit from this knowledge. Remember to write five things in your journal each night that you are grateful for. Please visit my new site, themerrymacshow.com and subscribe to my podcast and rate and review it. I'd love to hear your comments. If you'd like to leave a comment on this episode, you can go to my site, marymac.info, and let your heart share what it needs to share on my blog for episode 69. And remember to sign up for my private email list so that we can stay connected via email. You'll find the opportunity to sign up on my podcast website. There you will receive my book as well. And as always, remember to be happy because you deserve to. I'll speak with you again soon.